So uh, welcome everyone to this webinar uh, on Mexico's new union upsurge hosted by Labor Notes. My name is Dan DiMaggio. I'm an editor at Labor Notes, uh, and I've also been helping with our coverage of Mexican unions. Um, as, as Johanna said, this is a bilingual event, so we will have speakers in English and Spanish, and we will have interpretation in, in both languages. Um, and again, for those of you who need interpretation, um, if you're on a computer, you should see a globe at the bottom of your screen. You can click on interpretation uh, and choose English. Um, and uh, in Spanish, uh, para los participantes que necesitan interpretación, verás un globo en el fondo de, de su pantalla y haz clic en interpretación y elige español. Uh, thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us um, and hear from our panelists about the exciting wave of organizing by independent unions in Mexico. Uh, for decades, Mexican workers have worked under so-called protection contracts signed behind their backs by corrupt unions and multinational employers to lock in low wages, long hours, and poor working conditions. And even while many Mexican workers officially belong to unions and have union dues regularly deducted from their paychecks, these aren't real unions as we would think of them. They have no presence in the workplace. They're often headed by powerful establishment politicians uh, and the contracts they sign are often no better than what Mexican workers are already guaranteed by the law. But the protection contracts have served an important role preventing workers from forming genuine independent unions capable of winning real improvements. The workers in the US and Canada have watched in frustration as corporations ship jobs to Mexico to take advantage of the compliant unions. But that situation is changing thanks to the labor law reforms that independent union activists have been fighting for for decades. And most importantly, thanks to heroic organizing by workers at big multinationals like General Motors, 3M, and Panasonic, to name a few. So tonight, we'll, we'll hear about the labor law reforms and the union organizing. And we'll also hear from workers at the VU Manufacturing Auto Parts Plant uh, on the border in Piedras Negras about the ongoing challenges that Mexican workers face when they, when they try to form genuine unions. Um, we hope that tonight's webinar can encourage more international solidarity efforts with Mexico's independent unions. Uh, thanks to those of you who express an interest on the registration form and getting more involved in solidarity work. We'll be following up in the coming weeks about that uh, because there's, there's plenty of work to be done, whether it's helping raise money for solidarity funds or contacting elected officials uh, or even delivering letters to the customers uh, of some of these uh, companies where, where independent unions are fighting for a first contract. Um, so just to, 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 to close my remarks, uh, US and Canadian unions have always had allies uh, in Mexico's independent unions, just as Mexican unions have always had allies north of the border. Uh, there's real hope that a new era is dawning for Mexico's labor movement uh, and that we'll have more allies there and that this will strengthen workers across North America and allow us to engage in more joint bargaining and joint organizing campaigns. Uh, so tonight, to talk about that, just to briefly introduce our, our panelists, we have Jeff Hermanson of the International Union League, Julia Quinones of the Border Workers Committee, Yadira Sauceda from the independent union La Liga, the League at VU Manufacturing, and Paul Bocking of the Canada-Mexico Labor Solidarity Project. Um, so our first speaker tonight uh, will be Jeff, Jeff Hermanson. Um, Jeff is an organizer who's worked uh, since the 1970s with the Garment Workers Union, the ILGWU, uh, and later Unite, as well as the Carpenters, the Writers Guild, and the Solidarity Center. Uh, he's, he's currently working with the International Union League an organization of garment and textile unions uh, all over the world. 
and he's based in Mexico. Uh, so Jeff, turn it over to you. Thanks, Dan. <clears throat> and good evening, brothers and sisters. <clears throat> um, it's a pleasure to uh, talk about a very exciting new era in Mexico, <clears throat> which people liken to the New Deal in the US and the passage of the Wagner Act in 1935. Uh, just as in the US in the 1930s, there was an, a need to overcome the corporation's company union strategy. Very similar thing is happening here. As Dan said, <clears throat> protection unions dominated uh, employment relations in Mexico for many years, since the 30s, and um, artificially kept wages low. Uh, $25 a day instead of $25 an hour in uh, auto assembly plants. Uh, but in uh, 2019, because of the negotiation of the USMCA, the new NAFTA, NAFTA 2.0, I guess you could say, um, there was a labor chapter. And in the negotiation process, the Mexican government agreed to reform their labor laws and to ratify the International Conventions on Right to Collective Bargaining and, uh, and Organizing, Freedom of Association. <clears throat> and their labor law reform uh, incorporated those rights and incorporated the secret ballot for union representation elections, uh, requires all of the union contracts in existence in Mexico to be legitimated, to be voted up or down by the workers covered by those agreements, uh, and set up a new system of labor justice uh, that replaces the old uh, corrupt system in which the government, the employers, and the corrupt unions uh, uh, ruled on issues of uh, labor relations. So, you know, it's very similar to the situation in the U.S. after the passage of the Wagner Act. There's an opportunity, a new opportunity, to break up the company unions that have kept wages artificially low. And independent unions are taking advantage of this opening. Uh, there are some existing independent unions. There are few, but very important. Uh, and there are new independent unions forming, like La Liga, that you'll hear from a little bit later. Uh, in the auto industry, which is perhaps the single most important industry in Mexico, uh, there are 14 assembly plants in Mexico. Of those 14, up until recently, three of them had independent unions, Volkswagen, Audi, and Nissan. Uh, now there's a fourth, and that's at General Motors in Silao, Guanajuato, where the company union was thrown out by a vote that had to be run twice because the first time the company union broke into the ballot boxes and destroyed ballots. And so the U.S. labor authorities filed a complaint under the USMCA, the new trade agreement, and using the rapid response labor mechanism, complaint system, uh, they basically forced the Mexican government to investigate and remediate, which meant holding a new election. And when the new election was held, an independent uh, a dissident group of workers voted out the company union. And shortly thereafter, an independent union was announced and petitioned for re recognition, uh, had to win an, another vote against uh, three competitors, including the CTM, the, the company union. Um, and they won hands down. They won in a lad slide of 76%. And uh, they went on to negotiate a contract with a, a very big, largest raise in the history of that GM plant, which had been there for, I think, uh, 12 years. And, um, you know, they got like a 13%, 13 and a half percent wage and benefit increase. 
Um, so independent unions are winning representation. Uh, they've won representation in, I think, uh, recently in six plants, including the VU plant that you'll hear from, uh, including a 3M plant, a St. Cobain's auto glass plant, a Cummins diesel engine block plant, um, a auto parts uh, re remanufacturing plant, um, and Panasonic Automotive that produces auto electronics. <clears throat> so um, winning representation and bargaining contracts, as we all know, are two different things. And getting that first contract is very, very difficult. But they have been giving contracts, uh, and it depends on the on the employer's attitude, I think, and the strength of the of the workers. And uh, where the workers are strong, and the company is uh, complies basically with the rights of workers to bargain collectively, uh, they've been getting decent contracts, good contracts, better than the average contract signed by the company unions. Basically, the company unions. Uh, sign minimum wage contracts or sign contracts with a very low below inflation uh, wage increase. So, so uh, unfortunately in Mexico, there are few experienced organizers. There's no uh, tradition of union organizing by independent unions. They organize basically their own factory uh, in most cases through a spontaneous rebellion of workers. And uh, as a result, and then they, they emphasize, you know, their, their own membership, their own plant. They don't uh, uh, seek to organize other plants, even of their own employer or in their own industry. That is changing, we hope. Uh, the GM union, for example, is an industrial union and, and uh, is seeking to organize other plants in the auto industry. But because there's been little external organizing, as we call it in the US, there are few experienced organizers and few campaigners. Uh, most of the organizers in Mexico are in civil society organizations, not in unions. Uh, organizations like the Border Workers Committee, or the Worker Support Center, the CAT, Centro de Apoyo al Trabajador, or Colmenas, which is a organization, or SILAS, which is the organization that helped the GM workers organize their independent union. Um, so the Solidarity Center, the Canadi Canadian uh, Steelworkers Project that uh, you will hear from a little bit later, and Unifor, have provided financial support to some of these independent unions and to some of the civil society organizations that are supporting the efforts of independent unions. The Steel Workers, Unifor, and Workers United have direct engagement with union struggles in Mexico, as do masters, mates, and pilots. And uh, the UAW, the CWA, the Bakers and Confectioners, the UFCW, IAM, Unite Here, SEIU all have, and the Teamsters have, all have expressed interest in Mexico. But what we really need, what Mexican workers really need is direct engagement by US and Canadian unions that represent workers in the same employer or in the same industry. 3M, for example, USW and uh, UAW all have uh, representation in 3M plants in the US. I think there are 17 organized plants out of 100, uh, but still 17 is not a small number. And uh, they are committed to helping the independent union at 3M in Mexico uh, get a first contract. For us, VU manufacturing is a key struggle in the auto uh, industry because it supplies the US big three. It's a second tier auto parts manufacturer which supplies suppliers to the big three. Uh, 
they're bargaining hard. Uh, the CTM has not gone away. They're continuing, the company union is continuing to cause problems. It may result in a strike. We've had support from the UAW and Unifor uh, and the steel workers. Uh, Detroit DSA and Labor Notes has helped us ar uh, arrange delegations to visit the customers of VU manufacturing. Uh, the Mexico Solidarity Project has also been involved. We've set up a strike fund, uh, and I'm hoping that we can post uh, the strike fund uh, information or get it to you somehow. It's, it's in, in labor notes. Uh, but this is a key struggle because uh, we've got to show that independent unions can do better than these company unions and that they can get contracts and that they can improve wages and working conditions. The conditions in VU manufacturing are terrible. There's a good article uh, in Labor Notes. There's a good article in the Detroit Free Press just uh, yesterday, I guess it was. Uh, and so we're getting some publicity. We need to get the word out and we need to get uh, support, direct support. Hopefully uh, the UAW uh, support will be strengthened by the victory of the reform slate. Uh, the incumbent president has uh, written a letter in support, so we're, we're glad to receive that support. Unifor has talked to one of the customers of VU that they uh, represent in Canada. And uh, so we, we feel like this is the kind of direct engagement of US and Canadian unions with Mexican independent unions that can build a strong continental labor movement uh, that can raise wages in, and protect the interests of workers in all three countries. So thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Um, and we will have time for uh, questions and answers uh, later after our speakers, um, if anyone has any questions. Um, our next speaker uh, is Julia Quinones. Uh, She's going to speak in Spanish, so I will just give the interpretation information once again, if you need interpretation uh, from, from Spanish to English, you will see a globe in the bottom of your screen. Click on interpretation and choose English. Um, so our next speaker uh, is Julia Quinones. She's the longtime director of the CFO, the Border Workers Committee, um, based in the border town of Piedras Negras. She spent decades organizing with workers in the Maquiladoras there um, and is working closely with the new independent union at VU Manufacturing. So, Julia, thank you for being with us. Hola, muchas gracias a, a ustedes por la invitación. Y pues para mí ha sido este, un verdadero honor poder trabajar por largos años de mi vida apoyando y luchando de la mano con las y los trabajadores de las maquiladoras. Las maquiladoras realmente nos han dejado una deuda a un costo muy grande, porque llegan a México para instalarse y pues a costa de la explotación y del sudor de los trabajadores en México. Yo misma trabajé en una de ellas y yo creo que los mexicanos y las mexicanas necesitamos un cambio. Necesitamos realmente mejorar nuestras condiciones para que se mejoren las condiciones de vida de las mujeres y de sus familias. El CFO es una organización de base que está en el norte de México y por, por décadas hemos estado pues muy de cerca, ¿verdad? Este, primero intentamos formar un sindicato independiente, más bien lo formamos. Esto es desde ser de, por el año 2000-2002, una empresa grande, una multinacional la, de Alcoa. Este, logramos formar un sindicato independiente, pero con toda la represión, con un blindaje que había, una alianza tripartita del gobierno de la CTM, que es el sindicato corporativo y de la empresa, terminaron asfixiando a este comité independiente que fue el, eh, elegido democráticamente. Después trabajamos conjuntamente con el sindicato minero. Esto fue en la misma compañía, pero en otra ciudad. 
organizando a trabajadores de Alcoa. Más de 15 mil trabajadores se estaban organizando. En, la, en, la, en Ciudad Acuña había aproximadamente 7 mil trabajadores y una vez más, logramos la, que los trabajadores se afiliaran al sindicato minero. Y pues, ha habido demasiados eh, intentos y creemos, ¿verdad?, que este, han sido exitosos porque los trabajadores han, han hecho su trabajo. Nosotros creemos que los trabajadores son quienes tienen que hacer los cambios. Por eso, el Comité Fronterizo de Obreras y Obreros Busca hablar con los trabajadores en sus casas, en sus comunidades, donde ellos se sienten cómodos y en confianza. Es ahí donde empiezan a, pla a planear primero cambios individuales, después en cambios en líneas, hasta llegar a cambios y reformaciones en plantas completas. Pero todo esto pues ha sido el pasado, ¿verdad? Aunque tenemos... Y hemos tenido por mucho tiempo una ley federal este, muy progresista. Hasta el 2000, antes del 2019 estaba solamente en papel. En el 2019 se reforma la Ley Federal de Trabajo Mexicana. Pero eh, pensamos, teníamos mucha expectativa que al reformarse la ley, las cosas iban a cambiar para las y los trabajadores. Sin embargo, al poco tiempo nos dimos cuenta que para que se puedan implementar estos cambios, estas reformas, es importante que los trabajadores conozcan, que, que se apropien de esos derechos, porque nadie puede defender lo que no conoce. Y entonces esa es nuestra tarea en la actualidad, concientizar, sensibilizar a los trabajadores y las trabajadoras en las reformas laborales, que conozcan, ¿verdad?, que en la actualidad ellos tienen la libertad de, de escoger su propio sindicato, de determinar si quieren estar organizados. Y bueno, eh, también parte de las reformas es que los sindicatos tienen ahora la obligación de dar a conocer por escrito sus condiciones, de darles un contrato colectivo, de rendir cuentas a sus miembros porque nunca antes lo han hecho. Esto eh, sin duda va a ser un cambio, pero como dijimos, ¿verdad? Hasta que los trabajadores realmente puedan este, apropiarse y puedan enfrentar estas compañías transnacionales. Y bueno, también parte de las reformas, y no puedo dejarlo de lado, que es muy importante, es que ahora las empresas están obligadas a establecer protocolos de género. Están obligadas a, a erradicar o a disminuir la violencia en todas sus expresiones que existen en las diferentes empresas. Ese es el trabajo del, del CFO. El CFO no tiene una estructura sindical, por lo tanto no estamos en una competencia con los sindicatos, pero sí estamos muy al lado de los trabajadores de que sus derechos se respeten. Por eso ahora este, apoyamos a los trabajadores de BU para que se afiliaran a la Liga Sindical Obrero Mexicano. Y, pero esto no fue, aunque está la reforma, no fue fácil. Fue desde hace un año que las y los trabajadores empezaron a ver esta posibilidad, se empezaron a organizar. Y fue en agosto cuando se pudo llevar a cabo una elección, después de que la empresa invitó a la CTM también, a, la empresa prefería afiliarlos a la CTM en lugar de a un sindicato independiente. Afortunadamente, la voluntad de los trabajadores triunfó cuando en presencia de autoridades laborales este, de la Secretaría de Trabajo eh, hubo funcionarios del INE, que es quien se encarga de vigilar los censos en México, hubo observadores internacionales y la voluntad de los trabajadores triunfó cuando decidieron este, votar por un sindicato independiente. Y bueno, para, hacer, para llegar a este punto, el Comité Fronterizo de Obreras tuvo que documentar toda esta serie de violaciones y usar este mecanismo bajo el TEMEC, el Mecanismo Laboral de Respuesta Rápida, bajo el artículo, el capítulo 25. Y bueno, nosotros vimos, ¿verdad?, que este, si no hubiera sido por este mecanismo, posiblemente los trabajadores no hubieran podido triunfar. Pues yo creo que es muy importante el trabajo que se está dando tenemos que trabajar en conjuntamente porque todas estas luchas, el ingrediente principal ha sido la solidaridad internacional. Estas alianzas con, con sindicatos importantes, como mencionaba ayer, con 
UAW, con Steel Worker, con, con todos los sindicatos. Yo creo que si está, estamos trabajando para las mismas compañías transnacionales, es importante establecer alianzas y colaboración. También fue muy importante, este, pues otros grupos, ¿verdad?, de, de, de derechos humanos, grupos que han estado, este, pues siempre apoyando el trabajo de, de justicia social de los trabajadores. Y bueno, también estuvimos trabajando muy de cerca con el Departamento de Trabajo de, de Estados Unidos y de Canadá. Y este, pues a través de ellos, ¿verdad? Incluso agradecemos públicamente que hayan enviado cartas, porque aparte de la, de la violación a los derechos de las y los trabajadores, hemos enfrentado violencia física, violencia verbal, los defensores y yo principalmente, ¿verdad? Ha habido unos señalamientos cuando los movimientos que se han dado son colectivos, es la expresión de los y las trabajadoras, es el hartazgo, ¿verdad? Que tienen de buscar un cambio, pues todavía hay afirmaciones de que hay organizaciones, que hay personas que queremos desestabilizar la, la industria en México, que estamos buscando que las fábricas se cierren para que se regresen a los Estados Unidos. Entonces yo creo que son este temas en los que estamos, con los que estamos lidiando en la actualidad, pero tenemos esperanza de que el seguir trabajando juntos, el que los trabajadores se sigan capacitando, se sigan empoderando, sigan usando todas las instancias y los mecanismos, pues al final este, van a poder lograr contratos verdaderamente representativos, contratos que, que van a permitirles mejorar tanto sus condiciones de trabajo como sus condiciones de vida. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Julia. Um, thanks for thanks for joining us uh, tonight. Um, and we shared in the um, in the chat a link to uh, how to donate to the the Solidarity Fund uh, with the the VU um, workers um, campaign as well. Um, our next speaker um, is. Yadira Sauceda. I first want to make sure that uh, she's here because she's coming uh, directly from work to join this, this webinar. Um, so uh, is, is Yadira here or is she still? Yo, yo este, olvidé mencionar, verdad, que aquí a mi lado también está una compañera de, de BU. Hola, buenas noches. Tal Mientras se incorpora Yadira, tal vez Lupita puede este, compartir lo que es la, la lucha ahora actualmente en Bebo. Hola, buenas noches. Mi nombre es Lupita Martínez. Eh, prácticamente no soy de aquí, soy de Veracruz. Y muy encantada de, de estar aquí en Piedras Negras, Coahuila. Eh, ya llevo dos años, seis meses trabajando. Y pues prácticamente no me ha gustado lo que hemos vivido en la fábrica Bebo Manufacturing. Eh, el salario es pésimo, ganamos, pues eh, diría la palabra una miseria, perdón para decir la palabra, es eh, 312 pesos y la empresa nos está dando tres pesos más. Eh, en consideración, no nos gusta ganar ese sueldo. Aparte de los bonos este, de, de producción no hay, vales de despensa no hay, bonos de puntualidad tampoco hay. Y en eso estamos nosotros peleando nuestro contrato colectivo para llegar un acuerdo de que la empresa sí nos pueda dar todo eso que andamos pidiendo. Eh, igual este de ahorita se está en negociación la, la fábrica de BU con, con la liga sindical, pero siempre hay barreras. Pues la CTM siempre está involucrándose. Ahorita está comprando votos a, a los trabajadores. Eh, les ofrece mil pesos, aparte se los lleva a hacer como escándalo en, ¿cómo se llama? Al, al tribunal laboral. Al tribunal laboral, y eso no está bien porque pues nomás los está utilizando. Para que no apoyen la huelga. Para que no apoyen a la huelga. Y pues nosotros, pues por más que luchamos, este, siempre vamos a tener esas barreras con la CTM y la empresa.
Th thank you for for sharing uh, all that with us, uh, Lupita. Um, I'm still. Y, y Muchas gracias por el apoyo que siempre nos han brindado este, y muy agradecida. Esperemos que este contrato colectivo pues sí se realice y pues triunfemos Piedras Negras, Coahuilas, porque muchas fábricas lo merecen. Merecen mucho apoyo y esperemos que así sea. Thanks again. Um, y, and, uh, is Yadira here? Uh, Yadira está aquí para hablar. If not, we can go to our next speaker while we while we wait. Um, but uh, just to just to emphasize on the the VU uh, workers uh, there, they have set uh, um, a strike date of February twenty seventh, I believe. Um, uh, which is next week, um, as they uh, the clock ticks in their fight for a uh, for a first contract, um, and that is, they're also in the only factory um, in Mexico that has been the subject of two uh, complaints under the rapid response mechanism of the U.S. MCA, um, which is uh, and that complaint is currently being. Uh, investigated by the uh, Mexican labor authorities. Um, uh, for now, maybe we can go to Paul uh, and come back to Yadira. Um, so uh, Paul Bocking is the coordinator of the Canada-Mexico Labor Solidarity Project. That's a coalition of Canadian unions, um, including the, the Steelworkers, Canadian Union of Public Employees and others, um, and Mexican independent unions. It's aimed at building connections between the two countries' labor movements. Uh, he's going to talk to us a bit about that. Uh, thanks for joining us, Paul. All right, th thank you very much, Dan. Um, so I am Paul Bocking. I am the co-coordinator of uh, the Canada-Mexico Labor Solidarity Project, together with my, my colleague uh, based in Mexico City. Uh, so what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to briefly speak about um, how this project came about and, and what it consists of. And then I'll, I'm going to speak a little bit about uh, what I see are some challenges uh, we face for building international solidarity right now in this important context, uh, the resurgence of the Mexican labor movement. Um, actually, I see Yadir has, has now joined us. Do you want to go to her first or should I continue? Uh, we, we can go back. We can go to her. Thank you to everybody for um, uh, dealing with us. Um, okay, so... Uh, Bienvenidos, Yadira. Uh, thanks for joining. Um, and uh, Yadira Salceda is the general secretary of the union at the VU Manufacturing Auto Parts Plant, uh, which is affiliated to the Mexican Workers League. Uh, she and her coworkers, as Julia talked about uh, and Lupita talked about, organized an independent union last year, uh, defeating management's efforts to impose an employer-friendly union affiliated to the powerful CTM. And now they're they're in the midst of a tough battle for a first contract um, with uh, the employer refusing to budge on their uh, demand for, for a real wage increase. Um, so uh, Yadira, you can speak now. Hola, buenas tardes. Mucho gusto. Yo soy Yadira Sauceda. Soy la secretaria general de Manufacturas BU. Y aquí estamos a sus órdenes. Okay, I will um, just ask you a couple of questions. One second. Um, Y bien, um, okay, I will ask in English. Why, why, why did the workers at VU decide to form an independent union and join the league uh, instead of joining the, the CTM? Uh, 
unmute. Eh, no, no funcionan los subtítulos. Ok. Bueno, ¿por qué los trabajadores de, de BU decidieron formar un sindicato independiente uh, y unirse a la liga en lugar de unirse a la CTM? Sí, me, eh, pues todos los trabajadores, yo soy una trabajadora de Manufacturas BU, eh, nos unimos a, a, a la liga porque... Eh, hay muchas injusticias en, en, en la planta. Eh, ¿Por qué no, no unirnos con CTM? Porque CTM eh, es más defensor de, de la empresa que de nosotros los trabajadores. Nosotros lo que buscamos es eh, eh, hacer eh, ganar algo justo, tener un salario justo. Eh, en la, dentro de la, de la empresa eh, ha habido mucha, mucha inconformidad por ambos lados, o sea, la empresa y CTM. ¿Y, y qué hizo la, la empresa y la CTM para, um, para luchar contra el sindicato independiente? Eh, entre la CTM y la empresa nos han puesto muchos obstáculos. Eh, nos han abatido asambleas, nos han abatido... O sea, nos han ponido la gente, cada vez que nosotros tenemos una asamblea, nos ponen obstáculos donde no nos, no nos dejan hablar con la gente. La empresa está muy enfocada con la CTM. De hecho, ahora que estamos con lo del contrato, eh, ha habido injusticias notables de dejar salir a la gente cuando a nosotros nos han negado, como un sindicato mayoritario tenemos el derecho de permiso sindical y a nosotros no lo niegan. Y la empresa no le niega a, a las personas de CTM. Se salen entre 5 o 10 personas cuando nosotros pedimos un permiso de 2 o 3 personas y no nos lo dan. Y, y nos puede uh, contar un poco sobre el trabajo que, que ustedes hacen ahí uh, en BU como... Uh, eh, sí, hacemos autopartes, hacemos autopartes de, de automóviles, eh, los, los montabrazos, algo así, eh, es, lo, es lo que manejamos ahí en Manufacturas Bebo. Y para, para vehículos en los Estados Unidos y, y Canadá. Así es. Y... Así es para diferentes marcas. ¿Y cuál es el estado de, de las negociaciones ahí? Sí, ahorita estamos con la, no, con la negociación de, de lo del contrato colectivo, eh, donde la empresa pues no nos ofrece más que tres pesos más de lo mínimo. Ahorita estamos, estamos en eso, en, en, en lo económico. Hemos avanzado un poquito en lo administrativo, pero en lo económico la empresa en realidad no nos ofrece absolutamente nada, más que solamente tres pesos de lo mínimo. Ah, ¿y, ¿Y qué puede hacer lo, los activistas sindicales en, en los Estados Unidos y en Canadá para, para, para ayudarles? Mire, nosotros lo comentamos eh, cuando la empresa no lo, nos, nos puso esta propuesta, eh, pues era muy sencillo decir de que si estaban números rojos, pues ¿por qué no cerraban, verdad? Que pasa todo lo contrario. La empresa eh, cada semana te pide más producción, más producción. Nosotros vemos que sí, sí está saliendo material, sí están produciendo y, y no entendemos el por qué ellos dicen no hay dinero, no hay dinero. Bien, y, y hay otras cosas que, que quiere contar uh, la audiencia aquí. No lo escucho. Sí, perdón. Sí, es que hay, hay, hay otra cosa que, que quiere decir. 
pues que solamente estamos luchando por un contrato justo. ¿Cómo, eh, ¿cómo te pueden ayudar los otros? Uh -huh. Escucho muy poco. Bien. Um, entonces, mu muchísimas gracias a, a estar a, aquí con nosotros, Yadira. Y uh, vamos a tener uh, tiempo para preguntas después. Um, thanks, for, thanks for joining us, uh, Yadira, especially right after uh, coming from work. Um, but now, now we can uh, go to our next speaker, um, uh, Paul Bocking. Uh, from the Canada-Mexico Labor Solidarity Project, who I uh, I already introduced, so I won't do that again. Uh, but uh, thanks, Paul. All right, thank you. So um, first, I'll speak a little bit about how uh, our project came about. Um, it's a project which it involves uh, organizations in Mexico, including uh, the Border Workers Committee, uh, uh, which um, which Julia Quinones is, is present tonight. It also involves uh, the Frente Autentico del Trabajo, the Authentic Labor Front. It involves the, uh, the Sindicato de Mineros, the Miners Union, and it involves the Red de Mujeres Sindicalistas, uh, the network of, uh, of trade union women. And uh, in terms of participating organizations from Canada, Quebec, involves the Canadian Labor Congress, uh, the United Steelworkers in Canada, Canadian Union of Public Employees, Public Service Alliance of Canada, and uh, the International uh, Worker Solidarity Center of, uh, of Quebec. And uh, this project came about um, when uh, some Canadian labor activists had heard that, um, that the Canadian government was, was interested in, in following the lead of the US government in, in providing some support to the implementation of the labor reform in Mexico. And um, the Canadian labor activists were able to propose that um, some of this funding be directed directly towards independent unions and labor rights groups in Mexico themselves uh, to do labor rights education. And, uh, and so those Canadian labor activists who had longstanding relationships with, with their allies and comrades in Mexico uh, invited them basically to prepare proposals of what would you do with some more funding to, to do labor rights education. And, uh, and so fortunately, this project was able to get started on the basis basically of funding for those projects, which go over a four year period. And uh, they include um, house to house visits uh, with workers to discuss changes to labor rights, building from those house to house visits to, um, to larger scale continuing workshops on, on the new rights under Mexico's labor reform and on how to unionize. Uh, includes workshops and training specifically on gender empowerment for women macular workers, uh, includes radio broadcasts on major, major stations across Mexico, and includes podcasts, online courses on labor rights, and research on protection contracts, um, such as those held by the CTM and other uh, co protection contract unions uh, in Mexico, one, amongst other activities. One second, Paul, we appear to be having it issue with the translation um with the uh i think the spanish translation is now happening on the english channel and there's no translation on the spanish channel so i i think maybe you can just resume and okay i'll be fixed sorry so so the core part of this project is is basically supporting labor rights education um, in Mexico, um, with an eye towards supporting uh, work new work organizing, and the formation of independent unions. Another um, other important goal of the project as well too, is to help build um, new connections of solidarity between labor movements of uh, Mexico and Canada, and uh, perhaps to kind of rebuild some of the networks that once existed 30 years ago um, and the original kind of transnational campaigns against the implementation of the North American Free Trade Agreement. And so as part of that, uh, through this project, we've also been organizing uh, visits and delegations of uh, labor activists, organizers, labor leaders um, from Canada to Mexico and also from Mexico to Canada to share their experiences 
uh, and uh, and skills and to try to deepen those connections in, in an organic way. And so that's it's we're basically now in our second year of the project. Uh, we're gonna carry on for a few more years, and and I, it's I think it's really exciting. Uh, I'm going to speak a few a few challenges I, I see as facing in building more international solidarity where you work across North America in this context. Uh, one of which I think that at least speaking to unionists in Canada and the United States involved in international solidarity work is that a big challenge we often face is overcoming uh, a lot of the nationalist messaging that comes out from uh, the unions and labor movements in our own countries and often our own unions sometimes. Um, and it's often the case that while International unions will will demonstrate inter international solidarity by donating to good causes and human rights uh, advocacy, for example, Latin America. Um, at the same time, whenever there is a major employer that's threatening to offshore production or move a factory uh, to Mexico or el elsewhere uh, in Latin America, um, too often the messaging uh, to the both to members and to the broader public is about um, workers in Mexico are stealing jobs of people in Canada. And so it becomes this worker versus worker um, narrative. And there's often lots of flag waving, the Canadian flag and so forth. And I think that too often we see there's a lack of respect for the intelligence of our members um, to, to present a different kind of message that doesn't play off that kind of existing kind of mainstream ideas of nationalism. And, and instead, what we should be talking about is that uh, these are corporations that, yeah, they're trying to play off workers um, between different countries. And all you have to do is fight the corporations, not other workers. Uh, I think it's also critical that um, Canadian and, of course, U.S. unionists take their lead from our allies in Mexico uh, on the forms that the solidarity work develops uh, to avoid um, what could otherwise be an easy tendency towards reproducing unequal power relationships. And another point I'd make too, as well, is that a very, I think, interesting and complicated dynamic is that although the Mexican labor reform is national in scope, and so is the application of uh, the labor clauses under under the um, new Kuzma or what Americans call USNCA or what is called TIMEC in Mexico, um, also, it's interesting that the political environments vary from state to state within Mexico, and some states and local governments are more or less hostile to independent unions and, and favor more or less the protection contract unions. And so the responses of the state authorities also varies considerably as, as a result, so do the union strategies. And so coming from that, um, Mexican independent unions, we've learned, come from a diversity of different vantage points, as do unions in Canada and the United States. Unfortunately, sometimes um, I also see that efforts at building international solidarity um, are sometimes also hampered by interunion conflicts, often which have nothing to do with things that are happening in Mexico. And so one way I think of sometimes over trying to overcome that as well, too, is, is trying to build grassroots connections, uh, for example, between union locals um, in Canada and United States with union locals and, and, and unions in Mexico and labor rights groups in Mexico um, around really important concrete struggles like supporting our, our comrades at uh, VU, for example. And, uh, and a final point I'd, I'd like to make before I wrap up is, is that we are in a unique political context right now where the U.S. and the Canadian government are very involved in supporting the implementation of uh, progressive labor reform in Mexico. But I think it's also extremely important that Canadian and U.S. unions, we're always uh, very careful to maintain our political independence um, from the governments of our respective countries. Uh, in the case of the Canadian government, for example, it's also the enthusiastic supporter of uh, the interests of Canadian mining companies in Mexico, um, which is extremely controversial, uh, given the numerous conflicts with local communities um, that they involve. And of course, we're also going to see a lot of struggles, I think, in the future with Canadian-owned companies in Mexico, too. Um, so it's essential that Canadian and U.S. labor solidarity activists make clear that we do not serve the interests of the corporations uh, or even the governments of our countries, but we serve the interests of, of workers across the continent. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, and thanks to all of our uh, panelists uh, for joining us tonight. Um, now we're going to have time for uh, for some questions. So if you have a question, uh, just uh, find the uh, the Q and A and type in the question, and um, 
uh, we will answer those questions that we can. Um, I, I, first of all, wanted to ask a question, um, which myself, um, which is uh, <clears throat> in Mexico under the new labor law reform, um, workers have been able to vote, have, have had to vote for the first time in many cases on uh, legitimating their contracts uh, that the unions often negotiated behind their backs with the employers. Um, and so there have been about 13,000 votes, I read, um, 13,000 contracts legitimated, um, which is actually just a small fraction of the total contracts in Mexico. Um, it only amounts to about, I think, maybe 10% of all contracts. Um, <clears throat> so I have two questions on that. Um, which is there are 13,000 contracts that have been legitimated um, by the workers, meaning they they chose to stick with the union that they have. Um, uh, and in less than 200 cases, uh, workers have voted um, not to legitimate the contract um, and which opens up the path towards forming an independent union like the workers at GM Silao uh, did. Um, and uh, like the workers at VU are in the process of doing, um, although they did not have a contract uh, to begin with. Um, so my question is, why has it been so, why have there been so relatively few uh, delegitimations or votes against legitimating the contract? Uh, and then the other question is, what happens to all of the contracts that are not legitimated? Uh, before the um, the expiration date, uh, which comes in uh, this summer, I guess. So that's my long-winded question. Uh, Jeff? Yeah, <laughs> any contract that is not legitimated by uh, July 1st, originally it was supposed to be May 1st, but they extended the date, will become invalid. So <clears throat> right now, as you say, 13,000 have been voted up, 200 have been voted down. There are approximately 125,000 active contracts in Mexico. What this means is that tens of thousands of contracts will become invalid and millions of workers will lose uh, any representation. And, you know, is that a good thing? Yeah, it's a good thing, actually, because it opens the door to independent representative unions. Your first question about why so few contracts have been voted down is an indication of the control exerted by these company unions and the collusion between the company and the unions. Uh, and, uh, it, you know, it's very hard to overcome that uh, control. Uh, it's basically fear of being fired, losing your job, that causes people to, uh, to vote for the company union contract. Uh, Julia, did you want to? speak on this. Sí, yo creo que también una es este es uno de los vacíos que nosotros hemos identificado en la ley, es que las las validaciones de los contratos colectivos queda en manos de los sindicatos actuales. Entonces nosotros hemos participado en varias validaciones, hemos llevado información sobre lo que dicen las reformas a los trabajadores, pero al final resulta que el 90% de los trabajadores votó por el sí. Entonces lo que es lo que nos lo que sabemos es que es el sindicato actual el que controla la, la validación o ellos contratan a notarios públicos para que hagan este la validación. Entonces obviamente no son resultados reales 
pero también existe muchísima amenaza. Los sindicatos actuales están diciendo que si los trabajadores votan por el no, en automático van a perder las prestaciones que ya tienen. Y esto es completamente falso, porque las prestaciones, lo que ya los trabajadores tienen ganados, eso permanece. Entonces, sí, yo creo que este, va a ser muy interesante ahora después del, del primero de mayo, porque sí va, va a continuar hasta julio, pero si ya tienen una cita para una validación. Entonces, hasta julio vamos a, vamos a saber, pues, por fin cuántos, ¿verdad? Este, no creemos que aumente mucho ese porcentaje de contratos que han sido, que han sido validados. Thank you. Anybody else to talk about this? Um, okay. Another question uh, from the, the audience um, is, uh, is La Liga at VU uh, coordinating with other independent unions in Mexico uh, in the auto parts sector uh, or elsewhere? Creo que Yadira no está escuchando. Yes. It's okay. Uh, Yadira, preguntan que si hay, hay este, alianzas, coordinación con otros sindicatos independientes. ¿No se escucha tu, tu micrófono? Está apagado el, el micrófono. ¿Sí me escuchan? Sí. Ok. Eh, sí, eh, somos parte de, de un sindicato nacional eh, que tenemos presencia en, en Puebla, en San Luis y ahora aquí en Piedras Negras. Eh, también tenemos eh, contrato con un sindicato, con los sindicatos de Estados Unidos, eh, contacto, perdón. Eh, actualmente la liga busca ganar en, en dos fábricas, eh, en la zona lagunera y, y aquí en Piedras Negras. Y también complementando un poco a lo que Yadir está diciendo, sí existe una colaboración con sindicatos de autopartes en México. De hecho, ellas fueron invitadas en el mes de octubre a una reunión nacional con la FECIAN, que es la Federación de, de Sindicatos Independientes del, de, a, del Automóvil. Y, y sí, este, de hecho, hay interés de algunos de estos sindicatos de venir a apoyar como observadores, ¿verdad? Si, si se estalla la huelga, porque estamos ahorita en un momento muy crucial. Si mañana no se llega a un arreglo, es posible que para el lunes sea el estallamiento de huelga. Y hay este, posibilidad de que sindicatos nacionales puedan venir a solidarizarse con, con la liga, con las trabajadoras y trabajadores en Piedras Negras, TVU. Thanks. Um, and just uh, thanks again to Yadira for, for being here with us, uh, you know, after work and in the middle of negotiations um, with, uh, with VU uh, and on the, the brink of a possible strike. Um, and to, to Lupita también. Uh, uh, so another question from the audience um, is, uh, given its economic importance, uh, What about independent labor organizing in the countryside uh, in Mexico? Um, uh, what's, the, what's the status of things, uh, things there? Go ahead, Jeff. So uh, there's been a lot of struggles in Baja California in the berry fields of the area called San Quintin. There's an independent union there, uh, which also represents workers in melon fields in, I'm not sure if it, I think it's Sonora, and uh, workers in Jalisco. <clears throat> so um, 
you know, these are fields that export to the United States. So they are covered by the USMCA and they could be subject of a rapid response labor mechanism complaint. And there has been contact between the union, uh, which is called the Sindha, the Union of Day Labor, Agricultural Day Laborers. <clears throat> There's been contact between them and uh, um, fa Familias for Justicia, the Families for Justice, a union of berry and other fruit workers in Washington and Oregon State. They both produce for a company, a U.S. company called Driscoll's, the largest uh, importer of berries to the United States and other fruit. Um, but it's, you know, it's a work in progress. I, I think it's, it's a fairly new union. They've had difficulties. Uh, there have been a number of strikes, you know, just uh, wildcat strikes, uh, usually over profit sharing, which, you know, these companies all declare that they have no profits, so they don't do the mandatory profit sharing under Mexican law. Um, but, you know, the, that's the only sector that I'm really aware of that has uh, independent union movement. There are some, uh, you know, very old uh, peasants organizations affili affiliated to the uh, PRI, the party that ruled Mexico for 70 years. Um, but uh, there are very few uh, rural struggles to report. Um, not that the conditions are good, they're not good. Um, but that's the situation right now. Uh, we had a question about, um, hold on one question, um, question about how how is the level of violence um, in the country, in Mexico, affecting union organizing uh, or cross-border solidarity? I fall to you again, Jeff. Sure. Well, there, there's Julia. Yeah, Julia, Julia should talk to this, but let me just say this, that uh, there have been threats of violence along the border, which is a region of, uh, you know, the cartels are, are there, the human traffickers, the drug traffickers. Uh, there have been massacres in the region very close to where VU manufacturing uh, is located. There's some uh, overt uh, activity like following uh, union organizers in, in cars without license plates, you know, which is always frightening. I mean, you know, it's like a, a direct threat to the safety of, of union organizers and active workers. Uh, so it does affect us. I mean, people are in fear. Uh, but they're courageous folks who, who overcome their fears and, and continue uh, going on. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it's important that we recognize that there are these risks. We have written to the Department of Labor and to the USTR about the threats of violence, and Julia has been the subject of these, of these threats. And so I'll let her speak to that. Sí, pues es, ha sido este muy, muy difícil para, para los organizadores, para los defensores, aparte de este, luchar con estas compañías transnacionales, pues todavía, ¿verdad?, de recibir este, estas amenazas. Yo este, he tenido diferentes experiencias eh, en el... En, 
en el pasado, ¿verdad? Una vez este, más de 20 empresarios se unieron para hacer un desplegado en una página completa del periódico, del periódico local. Y después, con todo el apoyo de todos los secretarios generales de la CTM, pues distribuyeron esta, estas, estas hojas del periódico y pagaron, o sea, fueron, fue información pa, pagada. Y, y decía, era la misma retórica, ¿verdad? Este, Julia Quiñones es financiada por sindicatos de Estados Unidos que buscan que las empresas se regresen. O sea, este, eso ha sido una constante en el pasado. Y pues bueno, lo que nosotros hacíamos era como ignorar. En alguna vez dijeron que estábamos manipulados por sindicatos de otros países y que yo no, he, no tenía una nacionalidad mexicana, que yo venía de otro país. Entonces yo tuve que hacer una declaración para mostrar mi acta de nacimiento y decir, pues que soy de ahí, ¿verdad? Y, y no es que estamos en contra del capital. O sea, es importante que haya este, empresas, pero que sean empresas con salarios dignos, con condiciones justas. Y este, pues es, esto ha sido, ¿verdad? Este, por mucho tiempo y en la actualidad este, pensábamos que con las reformas estábamos eh, en condiciones más seguras, pero vimos que no, siguen repitiendo estos discursos, hacen estas conferencias de prensa, ¿verdad? Y lo hacen en medios de comunicación que generalmente son de propiedad de los mismos sindicatos chavos. O sea, el mismo sindicato tiene este tiene digamos, palancas en las, en las oficinas de gobierno. Por ejemplo, el sindicato CTM en Piedras Negras el, también tienen una regiduría. Es el gobierno del PRI todavía que gobierna en el Estado. Entonces, pues sí hay ahí como muchas, porque a nivel federal las cosas han cambiado y podrían, hay más interés de parte de la STPS en que estas cosas de violencia no sucedan pero a nivel este, estatal y local, pues todavía falta mucho por hacer. Pero como dicen, o sea, yo creo que cuando se lucha por la justicia, pues de pronto uno está expuesto a estas situaciones. Y, y pues pensamos eso, ¿verdad? Que este, sí es muy importante tomar medidas. Este, hemos, eh, hemos construido, ya hemos realizado protocolos, estamos identificando, estamos documentando en bitácoras este, incidentes de, de, de seguridad y hemos denunciado ya este, ante algunas instituciones y lo vamos a seguir haciendo porque yo creo que si queremos seguir avanzando en la lucha por la justicia tenemos que tener mucho cuidado, primero autocuidado en nuestra salud, pero también en nuestra seguridad física. Sí. Thank you, Julia. Um, I wanted to direct a question or two to Paul um, from, from about Canada. Uh, so there were some questions about, uh, are there Canadian owned gold mines or other mines in Mexico and uh, what's the situation there? Um, and uh, someone had also asked, uh, what is the situation um, uh, with teachers unions uh, in, in Mexico? Uh, and are they also uh, ind independent unions or are they uh, protection unions uh, allied with, uh, uh, you know, the, the long ruling political parties? Um, so if you could talk about that, great. Sure. Yeah, thank you. So um, in regards to the question about, um, about Canadian mining companies, uh, following the uh, implementation of, of the North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA, in 1994, there was a flood of, um, of investment from, especially from Canada, actually, from Canadian companies listed in Canada uh, to open up mine, mining operations in Mexico. And so, um, as I just, at least of a, as of a couple of years ago, uh, close to about two thirds of all of the mines in Mexico uh, were being operated by companies which have a nominal listing uh, as an address in Canada or a list on the Toronto or the Vancouver Stock Exchange. Um, so there's an incredible presence of Canadian mining capital in, in, in Mexico, 
And they are they also it's a it's a group which is has a lot of political power that comes with that, both in Mexico and in Canada as well, where in generally speaking, extractive sectors like in oil and gas have a lot of power as well, uh, particularly in some provinces. And so um Unfortunately, um, those mining companies have, in a number of instances, precipitated uh, conflicts with communities uh, whose lands uh, they seek to um, to exploit. Um, that we've seen in the past many situations where where national or state governments sign off on on mines being able to expropriate uh, people's lands, but the local communities do not. Or we've seen situations in which mining companies have arrived and engaged in, in um, divide and conquer strategies to to buy the support of some people while um, while antagonizing other parts of the population. Um, it's also the case as well that uh, the Mexican Miners Union has a, has an important presence in the mining sector uh, and uh, does a lot of organizing uh, amongst uh, both Mexican-owned mining mines as well as as foreign-owned mines as well. And they're one of the stronger, um, there's a strong independent union in Mexico. Uh, to the question about um, about teachers and, and other groups of public sector workers in Mexico in the context of the labor reform, um, some key parts of labor reform, particularly um, requiring uh, transparency in the union elections, uh, transparency in the conduct the conducting of strike votes, transparency through secret ballot voting in the ratification of collective agreements. Those measures also apply to public sector workers, including teachers. Other measures under the trade agreement, for example, the rapid response mechanism that was discussed earlier and which has been applied in the case of VU manufacturing, don't apply to public sector workers. It only, they, it only, that only applies to workers in sectors that are exporting to markets in Canada, United States. So it would not apply to, to teachers, for example. Um, unfortunately, it's, it's very narrow, frankly, the groups of workers that, that includes, although it is a very powerful and important tool and has been proven so far. Um, but um, like in, in Mexico, there's, there's, there's many different movements of, uh, and vibrant movements of, of, uh, of democratic teachers' movements. There are also, of course, uh, very established um, protection contract unions that do not significantly improve the conditions of their members and mainly act to provide uh, political support to ruling political parties. Um, and unfortunately, they have the upper hand in, in most sectors. Um, and I, I think it, we're yet to see a breakthrough occurring in the education sector, I would say, uh, in Mexico in terms of independent unions being able to grow dramatically. And I, I really hope that happens. As my own background, personally, I, I'm, a, I'm a high school teacher and uh, and uh, that's something which it's it's something I'm very interested in, and it's very important to me. And I have a lot of friends and allies who are teachers in Mexico as well. Maybe we can take uh, one or two more questions. Okay, go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, I just wanted to add to that that <clears throat> you know they use adjuncts in the universities here just as they do in the U.S. and they're they're unorganized. Uh, and it seems to me likely, you know, there's been a lot of uh, movement by adjunct uh, faculty at the big universities, the national university, which is just huge and gigantic, uh, movements, but no unions created. And, um, you know, I'm hoping that uh, some of the unions that organize academic workers in the United States, higher education workers, will show an interest in Mexico and come down and do a forum on how to organize adjuncts and graduate student researchers, because the movement in the United States is so vibrant. I mean, this strike in California is a huge uh, demonstration of the power of academic workers. And, uh, you know, I think Mexican workers, if they really understood what happened in the, at the University of California system, uh, would be very much inspired by that. So oh, maybe one one more question, um, uh, and then if anybody has any parting words. Um, but uh, what so a question was that uh, in in Guanajuato the um, employers uh, and also the the protection union the CTM attempted to persuade 
the G, the General Motors workers at the independent union represented foreign interests um, and, you know, was receiving money from some big North American union. Um, is that a common experience, uh, you know, and, and what impact has that had? Um, obviously, at General Motors, uh, the workers voted overwhelmingly for uh, an independent union. So uh, it seems like it didn't have much impact uh, there. But um, you speak about other instances. It's a common thread of just about every struggle by an independent union uh, to, you know, be denounced as agents of the gringos and <clears throat> trying to close the factory and send the jobs back to the U.S., which is, of course, absurd. Um, it doesn't seem to have much traction with workers. I, I really don't think it does. It has traction with the community, which, you know, is a problem. Uh, and it's repeated by the media uh, in uh, Piedras Negras, where VU is located. You know, there's stuff on the media all the time with uh, interviews with public officials and with union leaders, all denouncing Julia Quinones and the CFO for being in the pay of the North American uh, unions. Um, but as in Silao, it doesn't really uh, resonate with the workers themselves. They're glad for whatever assistance they, they can get from whichever source it might come, including from U.S. unions. So uh, it should not stand in the way of U.S. union uh, support for these movements in, in Mexico, because the support is much more valuable uh, than... Uh, you know, running running away from these uh, things out of fear of being denounced. Excellent. Well, um, I want to thank all the the panelists uh, for for joining us uh, tonight, and also thanks uh, to everyone. Um, you know, for 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 listening in to this webinar. We hope to to make it available publicly uh, at some point in the next uh, few weeks. Um, and we definitely want to follow up about, uh, you know, more solidarity um, actions that we can take in support of, of Mexican workers and in the interest of building uh, a stronger labor movement throughout North America. Um, we shared some resources in the chat um, uh, and where we intend to you know, continue reporting on this uh, stuff uh, at Labor Notes, uh, you know, and hopefully many other publications will also um, start writing more about this. Uh, but uh, thanks again to everybody for joining us. And uh, thanks especially to, uh, to Julia and Lupita and Yadira for uh, joining us, you know, um, in the midst of uh, some tense contract negotiations uh, at VU. Um, we shared the, the the solidarity fund. If you can donate there, uh, you know that is much appreciated. Um, and you know, be on the lookout; they may be on uh, on forced to go on strike uh, soon. Um, but we we will do our best to provide updates on their their campaign. Um, so thanks again to everybody uh, for joining, um, and we'll see you at at the next Labor Notes event. Take care. <laughs>